do want you to know that if you can hang in there through the entire sermon, at the end of the service today, there'll be sort of an encore of that music as Kevin and Leah give us a post So hang around, stick with me, and then you can have a, a little treat right at the end. Well, a few years ago, I heard my brother Joe, who is a pastor in Ohio, tell a story about himself. I want to start with it today because in one way or another, I think this story happens to all of us. But he was driving in his car one day, which I think at the time was like a six or seven year old Honda Accord with something like 150,000 miles on it. He pulled up to a stoplight and happened to notice the car pull up next to him in the next lane. And it was, a, it was obviously an older car than his. And his was already six or seven years old. It was a little more beat up. It had rust visible on the, on the door and it had a bumper held on with duct tape and that kind of thing. And he said he found himself before he knew it, sort of profiling the driver of that car. You know, maybe didn't go to college, maybe dropped out of school, wasn't very diligent, you know, maybe should have worked a little harder, then he could have been more successful, that kind of thinking. And then it, the light turned green and he kept driving. About two lights later, there was another red light, this time he stopped again. And a different car pulled up next to him. This one was a, like a brand new BMW luxury convertible. He looked over and he found himself doing the same thing. But what he said to himself was, materialist. <laughs> that story still makes me smile because in part, um, I kind of see myself. Because I can do that too. In fact, I think most of us can do that here and there in our lives. We're in the third week of a series from the New Testament letter called James. The book called James. And our series is called Street Level Faith. Just a little bit of review in case you missed one or two of the last sermons, uh, James, scholars tell us, is most likely the half-brother, the younger half-brother of Jesus himself. And James, at this point in his life, has come to faith and is now the leader or pastor of the church in the Jerusalem area. And this is just about 10 to 15 years after the death and resurrection of Christ. So the church is in its very early stages. And he's writing to Jewish background Christians who were going through a very difficult time of trial and suffering and hardship. And he's concerned for them. He's their pastor, he loves them, and he's concerned. And he's concerned because there's a growing disconnect between what they believe as followers of Jesus and how they are actually living, how they are behaving. Last week we saw that James urges them and us not just to hear the word, the truth of the gospel, but to receive the word and then to become doers of the word. And he said the gospel's like a mirror in which we can see ourselves as God now sees us, forgiven, born again, new hearts, new identity, new hope. He wants us to remember who we are in Christ. James is telling us as followers of Christ that we are to speak think and act in the world, in our daily lives, the way that Jesus would have us think, speak, and act. And one of the ways genuine faith is to shape our behavior is how we see and treat other people. So we're in James chapter 2 today. I'm going to read the first 13 verses. You can follow along in your Bibles or watch on the screens, and then we'll dig in and see what we have to learn today. James writing, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Now let me pause there. He's saying that there's something about understanding who Jesus is. There's something about understanding the glory of Jesus that should keep us from this thing, this attitude called partiality. He continues, verse 2. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly... And a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in. And if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? 
Are they not ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So let's unpack this a bit. The first thing we see is what James calls the problem of partiality. The problem of partiality. From the time I was in fourth grade till I graduated from high school, uh, my family lived in a small town um, about 40 miles north of New York City. Even though it was a small town, um, it was located in Westchester County, which at that time is one of the more affluent counties in all of the U.S. Uh, my brother, another story about my brother Joe, but he likes to tell a story to this day about when and how he realized that many of the, our friends were from families um, that possessed a wealth we couldn't even imagine at that time. Here's the story he tells. One summer, a family that had just started coming to our church uh, invited our family to join them for a day on their boat. Now, I was away at camp or something. I wasn't there, but this is the story my brother tells. The family owned a 35-foot yacht that they kept in Long Island Sound, just outside of New York City. And the boat in itself was just wildly impressive to my brother as a 12-year-old boy. And then when lunchtime came around, uh, the, the wife of the family uh, didn't bring out you know, what we would have for summer lunch, you know, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, something like that. She brought out these fancy trays of rolled up meats with the toothpicks stuck in them. And there's something about the rolled, the, he had never seen that before. And to him, uh, that was somehow the very pinnacle of opulent living. <laughs> the rolled up meats with the toothpicks. Uh, and then while they were enjoying lunch, just when he thought life could not possibly get any better than having friends with a yacht and rolled up meats with toothpicks, a much bigger yacht, like a 155-foot yacht, came floating by. And the lady whose husband owned the 35-foot yacht that they were on looked up and sort of nodded and said, that's how the other half lives. <laughs> and in that moment holding the fancy roll-up meat. My brother says his 12-year-old mind did a quick calculation. And he figured that if that was the other half, and one half was the boat he was on, that our family lived in neither half. Okay. <laughs> See, I think most of us know what it's like to think like that. At least at times. We all want to be in the other half, or at least have friends who are in the other half. And I think it's possible something like that was happening to these very early believers. James tells us, my brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, for us that might be like, you know, you get here to the parking lot, you see a car you've not seen before, it's a $250,000 luxury car, you know, parked sideways in, in the lot so nobody can touch it, and then, or you see a guy wearing a diamond-encrusted watch, you know, you would notice that sort of thing. He says, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Now, when we read the New Testament, uh, it's good to ask ourselves, why does the author feel compelled to talk about this to these people? Now, James had a reason. He, he's aware of something. We don't know exactly what, but we, I think we can make an educated guess. First, we know that these early Jewish background Christians were enduring a time of persecution. It erupted following the stoning death of Stephen in the book of Acts. Uh, they were being driven from their homes. Many had lost uh, businesses, lost income. Uh, and they're being scattered about the region. So we could guess that they are struggling, many of them, financially. Maybe 
on the edge of becoming desperate, financially speaking. Second, as the gospel spread through the region and spread uh, starting with the sort of working class folks in Jerusalem and it spread outward toward the Gentile world, it's possible that the more affluent people, uh, even Gentiles, were coming in contact with the gospel or were coming to faith in Christ. So this combination of forces seems to have produced a kind of preferential treatment of the wealthy, maybe even a competition among these early believers to align themselves with affluent people, maybe hoping for help or hoping for jobs, something like that. So what does James mean by partiality? Now that word to our ears doesn't sound so serious, right? Partiality, I mean, I'm partial to the Cubs, I'm partial to chocolate cake. I mean, partiality, what's the big deal? But the word used here in the Greek language has a much heavier meaning. It means personal favoritism. Specifically, it means to judge people and then to treat them differently according to external appearances or socionomic status rather than their intrinsic value or by their character. What he's talking about is prejudging people based on that which is external. Appearance, clothes, wealth, skin color, cultural background. He's talking about what we would call prejudice. Prejudice. And when I use that word, it gets a little more serious, doesn't it? The word partiality begins to take on a deeper meaning. I think James is talking about any number of isms in our world. Racism, sexism, classism. You know, sometimes we look around at our world and we see all that's going on. Divisions between people, divisions between cultures, divisions between religion, conflict and tension. And we think it's all sort of unique to our time, to the modern world. And then we read the Bible and we realize that human beings haven't changed much in 2,000 years. Technology changes, human nature does not. So here's a personal question. Who are the people that you are predisposed, that you sort of automatically think more highly of, without even knowing them? You know, people who look like you, or dress like you, or drive a car like you drive? And, on the other hand, who are the people that you are predisposed or just automatically think less highly of. I saw a video recently that was a kind of social experiment that some group did. It was filmed on a crowded city street, and there were two scenes filmed back to back, and you could just watch. You just set up a camera, and they set up a scene, and you could watch. Social experiment. In the first one, um, and it was an actor, walk, was walking down a city street dressed in a kind of uh, uh, shabby-looking jeans, uh, an old ratty-looking hoodie sweatshirt, had a wool cap kind of pulled back on his head. actor was in his maybe late 20s. He's walking along the street, and he begins to cough. And he coughs loudly a couple times. He begins to crumple. He falls to his knees and then keels over right on the sidewalk as people are walking by, clearly in, in distress. And he's calling out in a small voice, help me, help me. And he's laying there on the sidewalk. And the camera's just rolling. 30 seconds go by. People are walking by. Dozens of people. Uh, Just just a, a, a normal city day. A minute goes by. Five full minutes go by. Not a single person stops. The second scene, this very same actor uh, does the very same thing, only he's wearing a business suit, suit and tie. He walks along, begins to cough the exact same way, collapses in the exact same place, and within 10 seconds, Two people walk up to offer him help. What's interesting is, my reaction as I watched it, I wasn't surprised. I wasn't surprised at all. Because that's the way the world is, is it not? Some are approachable, some are deemed worthy of help, and some are deemed unapproachable, unworthy. James is saying, this is the way of the world. Always has been, but it's not to be the way of the church. Why? Verse 5. Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom 
which he has promised to those who love him. Now, James, in this passage, is teaching us three things about partiality. First, partiality is contrary to the heart of God. It's contrary to the heart of God. Jesus began his public ministry in the Gospels by saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. In Matthew chapter 5, he begins the Sermon on the Mount by saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, every summer, we as a church, the Chapel Street Church family, sends upwards of 150 students, middle school students, high school students, out on summer mission projects. Many of you support them in, in, in all sorts of different ways. Right now, there's a team in Ecuador. We had a team get back recently from Mexico, one from Milwaukee. And we send them into these experiences, first so they will have the opportunity to serve, and they do. They serve people who live in these communities around the world, and that's important. But secondly, we send them there because they can learn. They can learn from the people they serve, from people very different from them, people who speak different languages, people who have different color skin, people who have very little material wealth compared to what we have, and yet people who have a deep and joyful and abiding faith in God. So that our students can learn that God has chosen those who are poor in this world to be rich in faith. That it has nothing to do with material wealth. Secondly, he's teaching us that partiality dishonors those God loves. In verse 6, but you have dishonored the poor man. How? By failing to recognize the intrinsic value of a person before God. Way back in Luke chapter 7, there's a beautiful story. You, many of you will recall it and remember it. I'm just going to summarize to, uh, to you, uh, for you. There's a story of Jesus when he was invited to the home of a man named Simon. Now Simon was a Pharisee, which was the most religious of the, of the Jewish uh, ruling class at the time. Now, Simon invited Jesus for the purpose of tricking Jesus into saying something that he could uh, accuse him for. So Simon is being a little disingenuous. But in the middle of the dinner, a woman that Luke calls a sinful woman uh, comes into the home uninvited and begins to weep at Jesus' feet, begins to anoint his feet with expensive perfume. We're told then in the story that Simon judges in his heart both Jesus and this woman. Jesus, then knowing what's in Simon's heart, asks a question. He says, Simon, if two people owe money to a lender, one owes a small amount, one owes a very large amount, and both debts are forgiven, who will love him more? Simon says, well, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. Jesus says, you have judged correctly. Then he says, do you see this woman? Well, of course he saw her. She walked into this a party uninvited. But Jesus says, do you see this woman? You invited me into your home. You did not greet me with a kiss. You did not offer me water for my feet or oil for my head. All common courtesy in that day. Because Simon didn't care for Jesus. But she has wet my feet with her tears, anointed them with perfume, and has not stopped kissing my feet. I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. See, Jesus is challenging Simon to see himself as arrogant, judgmental, and ungrateful. And to see this woman as God sees her, not as just a sinful woman to be shunned and outcast and disregarded, but rather as a person of infinite value before God and loved by God. Thirdly, James is teaching us that partiality dishonors Christ himself. Verse 6, are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court, are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? Now, he's not saying that all affluent people are bad or evil. There are plenty of examples of very wealthy and very godly people in the Bible. Nor is he saying that those who do not have material wealth, the poor, are all saints. He's not, because there are plenty of people without resources who do terrible things. What he is saying is whether a person is rich in this world or poor in this world, it shouldn't matter to people who worship and serve the Lord of glory. Why? Because it doesn't matter to him. Way back in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel 16, we read, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. 
People look at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Apostle Paul in Colossians 3 writes here, meaning here in the church, the body of Christ in the world, there is no Gentile or Jew or circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Now remember, James' main concern in this letter is to emphasize that genuine faith always produces changed behavior. Genuine faith always produces changed behavior. He wants us to see that what we say, what we do, bears witness to what we believe. That makes sense. So partiality, favoritism, prejudice, discrimination in all its forms is inconsistent with both the character of God and with faith in Christ. Therefore, has no place in the life of a believer or in the life of the church. It's a problem. It's a problem that needs a solution, and that solution is what we come to next. Secondly, the power of mercy. Problem of partiality and the power of mercy. My wife and I have spent a lot of time driving over the last couple of months, chasing um, our college son who was playing baseball all over the country, been to Minneapolis a bunch of times, to Columbus, Ohio, to Omaha, Nebraska, to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, twice. 555 miles to Sioux Falls. And when I drive, uh, I have plenty of time to think and, and notice, you know, people's behavior in cars. And there are two things about driving that just irritate me to no end. I don't suffer from road rage, I don't think, but there are two things that just irritate me. One is, w- when, you're, when you're in a, a, a long line of traffic and there's a merge line, you know, there's people trying to get in, Right? What irritates me the most is when I wave someone in, like let them go in front of me, and they don't even acknowledge my generosity. (laughs) All I want is a little wave, you know, like a wave. Thank you, thank you. I realize your heart is big. You let me into the line. And when I don't get that, it irritates me. The other one is when you're in a long line in, the traffic's really slow, and it's as slow as far as you can see. And some guy always, there's always a guy, I hope it's not any of you, who, who who's just buzzing along the shoulder, which I think is illegal, but driving on the shoulder, and they go by everybody, and then they try to cut in way up there. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Don't let him in. I want to honk. But Don't let that guy in. Don't let him in. <laughs> just irritates me, right? So when you see someone behaving badly in a car, speeding, driving recklessly, texting, whatever. What do you think? I mean, if we're just honest, we think judgment, right? We think judgment. We hope, we hope, we hope, we hope the cop's going to see that guy. Or if we see that and we, later on we see the same car pulled over, like, ah, yeah, gotcha, yeah, got what you deserve, what's coming to you. But what happens, what do we think when you see the flashing lights in your rearview mirror? And then you glance down, you're going 70 to 55. What do you think then? Mercy, right? We go from judgment to mercy. James says in verse 8, If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So what's the antidote? What's the solution to partiality? James says three things here. First, he says, remember the royal law. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now most of you know he's quoting Jesus there. Once Jesus was asked, What's the greatest commandment? What's the greatest thing God ever said to us? And Jesus says, quoting from Deuteronomy 6, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And then he adds from Leviticus 19, and your neighbor as yourself. Now, this small, straightforward, easy to understand command, love your neighbor as yourself, is what James calls the royal law. And it might be the most radical and powerful sentence 
ever written or spoken in any language. Here's why. Think about it. Would not all the major social issues of our day, from racism to domestic violence to religious conflict to bad driving, wouldn't they all disappear in a day if people could just do this? Love your neighbor as yourself. But the problem is, people are broken. People are broken. We are fundamentally flawed. Always have been, always will be, which is why we need the gospel. Secondly, James says the solution is to recognize that partiality is a sin. He says, but if you show partiality, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. There it is, pretty simple. But wait, there's more. Verse 10, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you become a transgressor of the law. So not only is partiality sin, James mentions it in the same sentence as adultery and murder. We're like, what? Really? Listen to what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. You have heard it said to the people long ago, you shall, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders shall be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, rakak, sort of an ancient curse word, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. A few verses later, Matthew 7, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, sin is a very unpopular word in our world today. It makes everybody uncomfortable. Nobody likes to use that word. But here's the thing. We all know what it is. Even people who don't, pretty much don't believe in God know what it is. Because sin... It's called sin because it destroys. Sin always destroys. And partiality is sin because it destroys. It destroys because it devalues and dehumanizes people who were created in the image of God. Thirdly, James says, remember the law of liberty. Remember the law of liberty. He says in verse 12, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. First, what does he mean by law of liberty? Talked about this a little bit last week. He's talking to people of Jewish background who knew the Old Testament, knew the Torah, knew the Ten Commandments, and to them that was the law of God. The rules of God for personal holiness. But that's not the law he's talking about here. What he's talking about here is what Paul talks about in Romans chapter 8 when he says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. The law of liberty is the gospel. And the gospel promises a new heart because we've been forgiven through the sacrifice of Christ. We've been given new identity because we've been adopted as his sons and daughters. We have new purpose. We are called to serve him through the life of the church. We have new destiny because we've been promised eternal life. Then he says we are to be judged by the law of liberty. What does that mean? It means we are to be judged by the gospel. If the gospel sets us free, sets us free from sin and death, sets us free from condemnation, sets us free to see ourselves the way God now sees us, we are now then free to see people the way God sees people. So the law of liberty, the gospel, judges us by asking, have we, have you been set free from judging people? It's not our job. God's job is to judge, not our job. Have you been set free from judging? Have you been sent free to offer mercy? Now, what is mercy? The dictionary says mercy is compassion or forgiveness shown toward one who is powerless. In Ephesians 2, Paul tells us about the mercy of God. He says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace You've been saved. So mercy is grace. And those who have received mercy are to offer mercy. Verse 12, for judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy 
triumphs over judgment. James is saying the problem in the world is partiality. The solution is mercy. And if as followers of Jesus, we are not part of the solution, we are part of the problem. My father, I told a lot of stories about him, um, was a pastor for some 60 years before he finally retired last year. For most of his career, he was the lead pastor, the only pastor of a series of small churches. But for a short time while I was in college, he took a role as an associate pastor in a larger church in Florida. The church was actually big enough to have its own gymnasium, and I'd never seen that before. When I was in college playing basketball, my brother was playing basketball in high school, so we thought that was awesome. And that first summer when my dad was at that church, uh, my brother and I were playing basketball almost every day with uh, some of his new high school teammates. We'd play in local high schools. Wherever we could find a place to play, we'd play ball. And one day came along, and we couldn't find a place that was open to play, and we thought about the church. So we called our dad and got us into the church gym. So we brought our friends along, and we played, played basketball for a couple hours. Did it the next day, did it the next day. And like the third day we were in there, we noticed the senior pastor came walking in. Like he looked curious. He stood in a hallway just watching us for about five minutes, didn't say a word, uh, and then left. We didn't think anything of it. Next day we came back, and the gym door was locked. Not only was it locked, it was chained and padlocked shut. We were confused, so we asked our dad, um, hey, hey, can we get in? The gym's locked. And he said, well, senior pastor says the gym is only for church members. That seemed strange to us because nothing was going on in the gym. No one was using it. It was summertime. Why couldn't we play? And then it dawned on us. Two of the guys we had been playing ball with that summer every day were African American. They were my brother's teammates, they were our friends, but their skin color was different. And we sort of put two and two together. My dad left that church not long after that, partially because of that incident. James says, my brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Here's what he's saying. If Jesus is Lord, then the church, that's us, should never, ever be part of the problem. We should be part of the solution. Let's bow as we close our time together. Lord God, how we thank you for your word today. We thank you for these very direct, frank, and yet very contemporary words from an ancient letter. We thank you for your mercy and grace shared so freely with each one of us. Mercy and grace we did not deserve and do not, can never earn. And we long to honor you and worship you and serve you as the Lord of glory. So forgive us for our, at least at times, our small-minded and small-hearted partiality. And make us a people and a place, not of judgment, but of mercy. It's in your name that we pray.